I'm warning you guys up front, this is going to be a longer video because I could do this in five minutes, but you wouldn't learn anything. So this time I have a Sony SLHF 900 Super Beta machine. This one's got multiple problems. One, it has no sound. That's the first thing. Uh, but it also won't rewind or fast forward where crap. And that one's a little more of a challenge to find the problem with that one. Anyway, let's get started on this one. First things first, remove the top from the beast, connect it up to the sound system, and I'll put a beta hi-fi tape in and uh, see what it does. I've got the unit plugged into my cable, my house cable. I've got no signal passing through from the tuner to the outputs. So I don't imagine that we'll hear anything when I play a tape. This was serviced at another shop. And I have a picture. That noise in the background is replacing the water main up at the corner. It plays perfect, but no sound. There's the picture that's playing. Looks great. If you remember from prior videos when I used this tape, I had to re-record it because uh, the, the picture got disrupted and every 10 seconds, every time the tape made one rotation, it would blank out. And I now remember how it happened. We talked about this in the prior video. The tape got set down on that goddamn thing. And this thing has magnets in it. You can see them. And the magnets inside this, there's three of them, four of them. The magnets embedded in this work pad I forgot about it, the tape had been put down on top of this and it erased the control track of the tape on the bottom edge, which ruined my tape and I had to re-record it. I was trying to figure out for the life of me how the tape got damaged because of course I normally keep my tape sitting up on top of, I mean there's, there's, a, it's a, there's a speaker there, but it's a shielded speaker. A pile of test tape set up on top of my TV set top box. I mean, it's got a hard drive in it, but that's also shielded, obviously. And there's speakers, but I mean, nothing's that close to the speaker, and that's a that's a shielded speaker, right? So that's not going to influence the tape. And then I thought about it, and I realized, wait a minute, it had been sitting on. I had been working on a unit, and I'd had that stupid blue mat on the bench, and the tape got put down on the mat, and that's what damaged it. I think those magnets gotta go as I was complaining about in the last video because I keep accidentally degaussing my screwdriver to try out my new scope probe that I just got because I broke my other one. We'll check first of all and see if I've got any audio leaving the tuner board. We can check it right down here in the noise reduction area. There'll be audio in here to see if I can see any anywhere on this board. funny because I don't see any audio here either. Hmm. I expected I would see audio. And I see no audio even on the tuner board, which is interesting. Maybe there's a voltage just missing that's killing all of the audio. I have audio here on the output from the uh, IF, the sound IF. So there's the audio from the sound IF output, but it's not making it much further than this. That's where this was serviced last in Toronto. I'm wondering if maybe they forgot to plug something in when they put it together. I guess I'll have to flip the board up and just take a look and see if I can spot anything that's out of order on here. Because obviously I got, I've got sound coming out of the IF chip, so we know there's sound going into the, the audio circuit, but nothing coming out. Flip up the uh, main board and just look to take a see if there's any connections that are not plugged in, any connectors that aren't plugged in. These all have to be plugged in. The hi-fi board is down here on this on the back side here so these screws were loose so this one this board's obviously been flipped up before. So I'm just kind of doing a quick inspection to see whether anything has been this is the normal audio board on this one in video mic amplifier, right? Audio over here, AU13. So this is uh, just this, just the linear audio, which it doesn't have any linear audio either, so I just wanted to check that first before 
pulling the bottom off it and digging in a little deeper. Next I'll pop out the, the video board on this one and we'll look into this one. Check some voltages. So we got a regulator on this uh, unit on this board. Let's check here. We got a regulator here. We've got uh, seven volts going in. We got five volts coming out. So that regulator is working. This is the audio board for Hi-Fi. Right, the AF9, and of course it does the switching as well. What I do have is I do have audio, when I play back a tape, I have audio coming out of the DMOD chip. I'll show you the scope. There's my audio. Okay, so I have audio from DMOD playing off the tape. So we know that the that part of the circuit's working. To get this board out to check anything on the other side requires removing the back panel but you still don't have clearance so I gotta pull the side panel off here because there's a bracket in the back that uh, won't move out of the way so basically I have to pull the whole side of the unit off to get to that to get the side panel off in order to get enough clearance to swing the board out so that I can do things like check circuit protectors that are on the board because there are a number of circuit protectors on here and if one goes open you've lost voltages and if you lose voltages then things don't work so it's kind of a, a pain to work on I'm sure this has probably got other boards connected to it as well that are going to be in the way now I can see if I can just lift this out just enough that I can sneak this board out everybody thinks this old stuff is designed so much better for service they're wrong they've never had to work on this crap it's terrible to work on this stuff you think oh you got all these boards you can just take the boards out not when they're held in place with brackets that they didn't put cutaways in for this is what you kind of got to do to get these middle boards out you got to take all the other boards out so now I've got the, the uh, linear audio board hanging out here I've got the tuner board hanging out the top just so I can get to this board to check some voltages. So on the back of the board here we have the circuit protector CP001, CP002, etc. Um, there's one here, CP002. If we check these, we'll see that they're like one ohm. They're like two fuses in one, one ohm, one ohm. This one here, one ohm, one ohm, and then there's one down here. We check this one here. One ohm. Okay, I know where the fault is. Go on, I've lo I lost my negative supply voltage. Send you an adoption kit. Right this here. We got negative talker. seven volts. And Don't let positive seven volts on the op amp. Act. But I had Don't nothing. I had nothing on there. The entire negative, negative supply Go was gone. Or scan now. So, and I just happened to tickle it with a four volt supply. For I should have had the camera running because I just happened to tickle this and brought the voltage back. When I was testing it, I just kind of wet my finger and put my finger in around here and I could hear some sound coming back momentarily. Um, this is the op amp, there's two of them for each output and of course the entire circuit's got negative supply voltage on it as well. Um, but I lot, the, the, the negative 7 volt was missing. When I checked it, it's a JRC, uh, what was it, I, the IC number here again. JRC or RC4558, uh, I think it was, was what I looked up. And, um, or 4560, sorry, JRC4560. Anyway, um, pin 4 is the negative supply and pin 8 is the positive supply. And I had nothing, I had zero on pin 4. So that put me in the direction that I have lost a voltage and the voltage has come back. So we're going to go to the power supply because that's where the negative voltage is derived and see why I lost it. Let's say it came back. Maybe it'll go away again if I power the unit down. Will it go away? I still got my negative 7 back, you see. So somewhere along the lines, 
I lost voltage. But um, now I've got it back. If I play the tape, there's the sound that's playing on the tape. And my meters, of course, will come back, I'm sure. Yep, my meters have come back, so we know that the, uh, the sound is working now. And throw all this back together and we'll go back to the power supply and see where I lost the voltage. It could have been a connection on there. And I say when I just took my power supply uh, and just I say gave it about three volts and uh, as soon as I applied the negative terminal here the power came back and uh, I got my sound back. I wish I could have had the camera running when I did it. I should have started up the camera. Anyway, we know where the fault is now. It's probably a broken connection on the power supply, and by just tickling it, either that or I made a transistor work, or it could be the it could be their STR regulator. Hopefully, it's not that because that part is unavailable. And once again, for any of you guys that think that the old stuff was so easy to work on, I got a bridge to sell you. The old stuff was not easy to work on when you had to do crap like this to get boards out and disassemble a mechanism and take the chassis apart to slip boards into their place it was um, they were not they were not easy to work on And of course, boards are so fragile that if you so much as even breathe on them, they break. Now to put the chassis back together so I can put the other boards back in place. And put the back panel on it. Just so that I can dig into the power supply. And see where I lost that voltage. Now this board's got to latch back in and go in place like that and then this board can go up in place on the bottom. See I get these old beta machines because um, well, first of all, I was trained by Sony on beta. That's where my all my formal training for VCR, incidentally, and I think I've mentioned this before, but all my formal training for VCR was on Betamax. That's what I trained on back in the early 80s when I worked for Sony. I did take a bunch of Super VHS and VHS courses too from the put on by the other manufacturers when I was working at the service center because we worked on all types of equipment there, but... Uh, most of my practical training was, in the early days anyway, was on beta. I did hundreds upon hundreds of these machines. And yes, beta was popular in the uh, early 80s. In Canada they had a 50% market share and it remained fairly strong for a number of years. It wasn't until the big video chains came along that only rented VHS, Blockbuster. When it was still mostly uh, mom and pop operations, most of them had both. And that was mainly because the owners of the stores liked beta. They liked the picture quality that the beta machines provided that the VHS just couldn't deliver. So that kept the uh, beta rentals 
going for a number of years. Of course, once Blockbuster uh, basically dominated the rental market, that changed. But uh, for a long time, Beta still had a pretty good stronghold in the market. I don't know how it was in the States. I'm, it may not have been 50% in the States, but here it was. And that continued all throughout the 80s. The 90s rolled along and when Blockbuster and their competitor, out here it was Rogers, Rogers Video, when they started only stocking VHS and a few laser discs, and then of course once DVD came along, that was the end of, for right there for anything to do with beta. Okay, now I'll just remove the power supply. I can go over that with a fine tooth comb. See where the voltages were being lost. Find that negative supply line. See if there's any connection problems on it. The fact that it came back is telling me it's either an IC or a transistor or a connection that's at fault. Just got to remove a few screws here to remove the power supply. Probably have to remove the back panel too with the way these things are built. Screw. Okay. Yeah. The back panel out of here, and then I can lift the transformer and everything out. Not a lot of room to get this out of here, but it will tip out and tip over like this so that I can work on it. We'll unplug all the cables here first so that I can give the supply an inspection. They are keyed and color coded. There's two yellow ones but they've got different number of, of uh, pins on them so I can just unplug everything here and take the power supply out. We'll, we'll turn this on its side get it out of the way for now. Because I'm fully convinced the problem on this unit was is on the power supply. That's the only thing common to all the different circuits that weren't working because we had no signal coming out of the MPS decoder either, right? So they're all fed off the power supply. This is the regulator board. Look at this one. See how this. See if there's any connections that are broken on here. If we look down at this uh, regulator board, we'll see C010 and C007. If we look down here, we'll notice that the negative to the positive terminals are connected to what appears to be the ground side. So this will be the negative supply. Let's just check this out here. So the positive side of this is connected to ground, right? As you can hear on the meter beeping there, that's continuity to ground. Positive side to ground. So this is the negative supply. So if we look at the negative side, which is from here, this is the negative side. We'll see that it goes up to, I think it's this one here, Q002. Uh, yeah, it comes right up here to Q002. This is going to be the negative regulator. Now watch what happens when I touch this transistor here. Q002. Can I get a closer up shot? Because you'll, you'll notice that it is uh, that pin is obviously not at a good connection because I can move it. That's the negative regulator. And likely that's all the fault was. And when I put my negative supply to it, either this transistor is, is cooked and gone open, or this is the base, I believe that's the base, right? Emitter collector base. 
uh, collectors feeding in so this will be the power coming out on this one here this is the regulator there's a zener diode and we follow this one here along uh, there's a zener where was it right here so that goes along over to here this is the negative reference the zener for it that sets the voltage and then there's a resistor also across here to give it the bias voltage so you lose that supply and the, the voltage will drop off here this one here is going to feed out and that will be the one that goes around to feed these other plugs anyway. Um, I'm going to heat up my soldering iron, we'll resolder that and then give this a try and see whether it, uh, of course the thing's working now so the only thing I can do is continue to test it but that I think is probably where our problem is on this one is this negative regulator transistor connection is bad as you can see it moves and it shouldn't, it should be solid but the reason it's moving is because it's cracked right along in here. There's hairline cracks along there, obviously. You can see it. If that connection didn't appear to be cracked like that, I'd be changing that transistor. But I think it's okay because it's working. I'll just redo a few of the other ones in this same vicinity. A few minutes ago when the camera wasn't on, I heard this rattling sound. Da -da 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 it was more like a I look over and old Woody Woodpecker was sitting there on a cardboard box in my right in my uh, opening to garage door op was open. He was sitting on a cardboard box, pecking away at the box. Of course, by the time I turned the camera around to try to get a picture of him, he flew away. But uh, he's pecking away at a box. I have to make sure there's any other transistors that are on here. I think I got this other one. That's an IC. We'll make sure it's good. Well, I've got the board out. I might as well just do all the semis that, you know. I mean, this thing's 40 years old, so we'll give it a little bit of a helping hand and then pop the regulator board back in. I have my power supply set for 300 milliamps, 3.9 volts. That's what I use to tickle the circuit and give it the negative supply. And then it brought the sound back. I fully expected that when I removed the supply the sound would go back, go away again. That's why I wasn't recording when I was testing uh, because I, I fully expected that it would cut out and then when it didn't, okay, then we, we've got a connection problem or something that I've just restored by giving it a bit of a juice and I've just restored it. Since I've got the power supply already apart, I think I'll also, if I can get at it, um, these other regulators get at them. Uh, pull this regulator out so that I can get to the transistors on here and also do the big IC regulator because these were a common failure. Uh, connections go bad and then it causes the regulator to blow. This one I think just does all the positive voltages and switching and so forth on this one but I've certainly changed enough of them including on my own my own when it failed at one point. So we'll just lift this board out. I still can't get at it. I guess I can. I want to get to these other transistors down here and regulator uh, ICs and then we'll resolder this one while I'm here just to make sure that it's not going to go bad because this is an SDK 5441 and uh, they are unobtainable these days and they did fail on them because they, they run quite hot. But we'll take care of it while it's here. Just take care of the connection problems that sometimes happen. We'll do this IC down here. IC003, 
because the connections on here already look like they're starting to crack. Time to put all the plugs back in. What the hell? Where's my sound? Oh, I got sound here. Right, meters are working. Hmm, there was a TV. DNA. Ah, ha ha ha. I didn't mute. It, uh, the word mute doesn't stay on the screen on the set. It goes off. And of course, it turns on closed captions when it's in mute mode, but there was a commercial plane, so there was no captions on it. So that was why I had no sound. I was like freaking out there for a minute. It's like, what the, what the hell's going on here? Okay, got my sound back. Now I gotta fix the, the um, gotta pull the front panel off a bit here because one of the, um, the knobs came out of place. There we go, left and right. Okay, that's working. Put the uh, tape in and play the tape back. Oh, some of my other buttons are off here. My record button's off, so I gotta pull the front off again. Slide this back there. Okay. Now it works. I don't want to put it into record. I don't want to wipe my tape, so I'll just take the tape out just so I can make sure that the record switch works, which it does. I always like this on Sony. You had an actual slide switch to put the machine into record. You didn't just have a record button. No, you had a switch. You're not making a mistake. You're not hitting the wrong button and wiping your recording. And you got to do that. Make sure all the features work. There's my tracking. Search forward. Search backwards. Obviously, can't let that play. And this has got a slow tracking on it as well. If I open up this side here, I can go slow motion, adjust the slow tracking, and adjust the still adjustment. And somewhere on here, there's a. I forgot how to work this machine, it's been so long. There's a button, I think, to turn on the jog shuttle. Or maybe not. That works.
There we go. One frame at a time, forward and backwards. It's a pretty good freeze frame on this. I'm pretty good slow mo. I mean, slow mo forward, one frame at a time, backwards. You could adjust the tracking for this too. Here we go. Forward slow mo, regular speed, double speed, and search. And then it'll go back to playback. Double speed playback. Get double speed with sound if you track it right. Probably won't look good on this TV, but you can play back at double speed with kind of distorted sound. So check the alignment of this machine while I'm at it. I just spotted something else wrong with this thing. Look at it won't rewind because the tape is under such high tension. It'll barely fast forward too. It's like the uh, it's like the tension is way too high on this thing. Why? If I take the tension off, still won't rewind. Is the drum polished on this? I didn't even look at it. I wonder if the drum's all shiny and polished. That would certainly explain why the tension would be as high as it is. I've got the mechanism loaded so that I can do the back side of these guides. Because of course these guides pop up. So if you're in the unloaded position, they're under the deck. I'll clean the audio control head. And the tape guides, everything that the tape touches. Oh, that's loose. <laughs> that's not supposed to be loose. That would affect the alignment right there. That was, see, look at this, see this? That is not supposed to be loose. That's supposed to be tightened down. The drum actually does look quite shiny, the upper drum, so I may have to take that off and just resurface it with Comet Cleanser. Let's just see if the rewind is any better now. No. See, it's still sticking. Yeah, that drum's got to come apart, unfortunately. And you'll see why in a minute once I get into it. So first things we'll do is we'll we'll mark it so we know what position it's in. Put a couple of scrapes there just so that I know what position to bring it back to. And uh, we'll take off the the top. This is so that I can take off this retainer that it guides the tape in. I don't like taking these out because you gotta kinda tweak them to get them back in, but that is off and then I can remove that screw. I don't remove these ones, just that that uh, Allen key and then I can lift the head drum off. And of course we make sure that the heads are not away, they're not over this way. We make sure the heads are like here and here so that when this cuts loose it doesn't damage the head. Yep. Three millimeter to remove this.
and lift that drum off. You hear what I mean? Look at how shiny this is. It's like a mirror. That has to be, it should look like this. So when it looks like this, what happens is the tape stick to it, especially the higher grade tapes, become so smooth the tape actually sticks to this and it stops it from rewinding. So I'm going to go get some uh, piece of paper towel, wet it, and put some Comet Kitchen Cleanser on it, and we'll uh, work this together. I'll show you how it's done. I've done it before, but I'll show you on this one again. This is what I used. This is what I was uh, taught to use when I worked for Sony. Yes, we used this there. It's a kitchen cleanser. It's just about the right abrasive this to do this without damaging. So we make a paste on a wet towel and we're going to use this to remove the shine. And we just work this in here. And it will polish this up and take the shine away and return this to what it looked like when it was new. Because you can't buy these parts anymore, obviously. They haven't made them for ever. And even when the upper drum was available, most people didn't opt to replace it. They opted to do this, even though a replacement drum is probably, the upper drum was probably the right way to do it. It was expensive. The upper drum itself was around $70 or $80 for the part, plus the labor. So when we did this, we just charged them the labor, which would have been the same, and polished it up, and it worked fine for years. What this does is this just takes just enough off the surface off to rough it up enough that the tape doesn't stick. I'm just going to work on this for a while and then I'll take it inside and we'll wash it off and when I'm done it should look like the rest of the drum. As you can see right now most of the shine is gone even in the, even in the, in the shot now which has still got Comet all over it. It's greatly improved. If you go back and watch my video that I put up years ago, the Sony Super Beta Training Seminar, we talk about this. We talk about this phenomenon, stiction problem. People would buy this machine and they would buy the expensive tape, the ultra high grade tape, thinking that they were going to get the best possible picture. And the ultra high grade tape, the t what made the tape better than a regular tape was it was a finer grain and that finer grain could record higher frequencies. The problem with the finer grain was it was also much more smooth and it caused this problem to accelerate. So shortly after the high grade tapes came out and this design with the three piece or the two piece drum, we never had this problem so much with, well I guess we did, we did have it with the three piece drum as well, but not to the same extent because it was a, it was a thinner material because the middle portion of the drum was a quarter inch wide and it spun like a VHS cylinder, it was a three piece. So we didn't have the problem of stiction to the same degree, it still happened, but it didn't happen to the same degree as it happened on these machines. So this is how it looks once it's been done properly looks brand new. All that excessive shine that causes the tape to stick has been removed. So we reassemble it the opposite way. We took it apart again. Make sure the heads are facing away so that you know, there's no chance of you know, dropping and hitting the, uh, the head with the upper drum assembly. We're going to fit the drum back on and then put the screws in or put the screw in. Once you get snug, you want to make sure you line up the scratches that you put in so that the head is as close or the upper drum is as close 
to where it was when you removed it as you can get it because that will affect the alignment so that's why I put the scratches in and you can loosen just so that you can get the alignment as close as you possibly can and then tighten down Geez, it's still bogging a lot on, like the tension's way too high it feels like still. We got, we still got problems on this thing. The back tension's way too high. I mean, it'll play, it's just, it shouldn't be uh, sticking like that. See what the tension is like on the tape itself. Could be the tape spools themselves are sticking. Let's take them apart and lubricate the uh, underside of the reel tables because something certainly is, uh, or the brakes aren't coming off, or something's going on under the, underneath here. So I got to pull the reel table out as well. So to do that, I have to pull the video board. Just short everything out with my watch. There. Make sure that we've done a real good job on it. Or I should say this the system control board. That's the that's the video boards over here. Okay, now I gotta pull the uh, the real table out. I was thinking perhaps this lever here was sticking. But everything seems to be working as it's supposed to. Like it seems so sluggish. I thought this was hard to get out. It's probably going to be worse trying to put this back together. So after 10 minutes of fiddle farting around, I got the uh, real assembly back in place. Okay, what we have here is we have a, a bad solenoid. Probably a fuse is blown in the solenoid here. Watch when I hit rewind. And if I the solenoid that releases the brakes is not working. Okay. So I gotta pull this thing apart again and check this. I bet you there's a fuse internal on that that's gone open. A little a thermal cutout type fuse. This is this is not working. It's not moving. More than likely that's what's wrong. And so there's a thermal cutout on this solenoid here that's not uh, 
clicking in. Didn't see anything when I did that, did I? Did I see any movement of that solenoid when I unplugged it? You see, the other solenoids are working. This one's not pulling in. This is what releases the back tension brake. So we'll lift this out again. Now that I've got all the wires pulled out of the way, it's a little easier to remove it now than it was the first time. All the wires were in the way. Still a pain in the ass to get out, but just like that. Okay, this is the solenoid right there. And uh, there's a, typically a thermal fuse right, right there. And I bet you if I cut into this, and measure that little thermal fuse, it is going to be open. Pretty much assure you that that little thermal fuse is going to be open, is it? They failed all the time. So we removed the solenoid to check it. Check the coils while we're at it. Uh, red goes through to orange and red goes through to the brown wire. Here's the red wire here. Check it through to the orange. We have continuity. We check it through to the other end of this coil. We have continuity, but we have nothing there because the thermal is shot. This is open. If we measure across here, we'll see that it is indeed open. So I gotta short that out, and then we'll put this up, put some tape around it again, put it back in, and fingers crossed it's gonna rewind properly. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? It could burn out. It's not going to catch fire. It's low voltage, so it's not like we're. It's not like it's a fire hazard. It's just worst thing could happen is if it if it were to overload, is that the coil could burn out. I guess those are the risks that we got to take now because these parts aren't available, and I could rip it out of the other one, but I'm not going to. It's too much work. That'll fix it. Never give trouble again. All right, now I can put this back together. Gonna to put it back into its frame. And put the plunger back together. It's a two-piece plunger. There's uh, pieces that go in the front and the back on this one. So to put it back in the frame, I have to uh, put the back piece of the plunger in the back side, like that, and put the front piece of the plunger in the front side. Yeah, but you guys have never seen one of these, right? This is a double plunger. So one is to kick it the other way to make it release, and then it pulls in. And then this one here kicks the side to push it back, and it's held in place by a, uh, a double-sided bracket assembly snaps down like that and then this piece goes back over the top like that so that it can, it can operate that all right now pull the wires back around through here and uh, we'll reassemble this thing again and that should hopefully this time fix the rewinding problem i don't know why i didn't check that one ahead before because i knew that that problem existed on these things I just, uh, I was looking for a more of a mechanical problem when I pulled it apart the first time and didn't see any, so I put it back together and just totally forgot about that solenoid because it has, I have had that fail before. That was quite a common failure back in the day on these machines. Just got to get this lined up and drop it back into place. Get all the wires out of the way, first of all. That thermal fuse also goes out on the main solenoid, which is the one that operates the front loading mechanism. It fails the same on, on those. And you can do the same. You can jumper it out because you can't get them anymore. Panasonic G mechanism has a solenoid that operates the mechanism. 
below the chassis, uh, the one that's driven by the capstan motor, that one also blows that same thermal cutout on a solenoid wrap the same way. The uh, red plug plugs in way back over here somewhere. It was underneath here. It faces sideways. It's right there. That's where the solenoid plugs in. It's hard to get to. It's kind of underneath here. There. All right. And then of course in this big bundle of wires here that's all clipped into the edge here on the edge of the circuit board. Clip down them again and put the cover in over top of the motors. I gotta tuck all these wires down here so that they don't press on the board too badly so that the board will fold back into place. All right, okay, let's try it again and see what happens. Just about. Is it going to rewind properly this time? I'll find out pretty quick. Ah! Now it rewinds properly. Now I'm happy. Okay, now I can do the tape path alignment. Because I couldn't even get the... Um, I couldn't even get the, the tape to fast forward out to the point where the, the tracking alignment portion started because it wouldn't fast forward. It was in such bad shape before. The RF sweep starts at like, uh, what, four, eight, about 12 minutes in because each of these are four minutes. So four, eight, and 12 minutes in for tracking. So I got to fast forward to the 12 minute point because when it starts, it starts with color bars. So. And the tape is blank at the beginning, so I have to fast forward it. And as soon as the counter starts moving, that's the color bar portion of the tape. And it looks to be pretty much in the center, you know. If it's off, it's not off by much. Uh, i got to turn Super Beta off. Here's a good example. You can see it on the color bars. And I'll show you, I'll show you the screen. So this is what Super Beta looks like. If you're, or this is what a beta tape looks like if you're in super beta mode. You turn off super beta. Do you notice anything? Look around where it says B2, 3 kilohertz. That's off there and that's on. Uh, probably see it more on the monoscope. So if I go up to the monoscope portion, which is at the 4 minute mark. The monoscope portion probably will see it more because of the way it's modulated. That's that. Uh, that's the dihedral adjustment right here. If I play around with the tension, we'll see the dihedral on this machine is pretty much perfect, right? Because they put the switching point right in the middle of the of the of the field. But if I look at the if I switch super beta on and off, make sure that my tracking is dead center on here. Okay, I'm going to switch the super beta switch on. Where is it? Notice the difference? Look at the stability. Look at around the switching point too. Off, on, off, on. Stability is not quite the same. You notice it? Look around the circle. Right around here and, and around here when I switch it on because this is not a super beta tape. So I switch it on. The stability is not as good. See around the edge here? 
right around there. Switch it off, back on. Look around here, it's off now. Those are dropouts. On, off, on, off. Because this is not a super beta tape. I'm gonna go ahead out to the um, tracking portion. We'll put the scope on it and check the tracking. So the factory alignment tape, this is uh, a proper alignment tape. It only has one channel. We see some degradation down here. We're gonna adjust the exit guide which is the one that's closest to the audio head. First of all, I set the tracking control in the center, whatever the hell that is. Okay, tracking controls in the center, and then I'm going to adjust the tape guide here, ever so slightly, with a screwdriver of the right size. And that's it. See? That's all it took. It was just to crack that over just a bit. Just like that. We want that waveform completely flat, which we have. I'll show you the adjustment that I made. Any Sony Beta Tech worth being called a Sony Beta Tech did this to his alignment tape. It cuts a groove in there so that you can get at it. But that's the guide right there. And we just, I just turned that literally I just cracked it. I, I turned it maybe one degree counterclockwise, but it doesn't matter. You go either way, but crack the paint seal on it. I'm going to repaint it. And that got my alignment absolutely perfect. And I just used a flat blade screwdriver like that. Right, that's all that was used. That has my alignment now correct. So we can also check the uh, the beta 3 portion, so I can forward on this as well. Uh, the next one that comes up is color bars. I think it's in beta 3. Yes. So that will come up at the 16 minute mark, which is right now. And we'll have color bars in beta 3, and they look perfect. If I look at the scope, we'll see that the waveform is perfect. So that's our waveform. One field, we'll look at both fields for beta 3. It's looking good. If I adjust my tracking control, it's perfectly flat. This is that, no, actually, this is beta 2 hi fi. They mixed it up. I, I made a note of this on the label and I still screw up. Number 5 is beta 2 hi fi. I marked it on there. It's, um, it shows on the screen what it is though. Beta hi fi, beta 2. So we can go to the next one out, which is the, the a 20 minute mark. Here. And this should be monoscope. No, that's beta 3 color bars. They mixed it up. Followed by monoscope. And yes, you can hear the flutter because it's not hi fi. It's linear, but it's in beta 3. And it plays, and we look at the tracking, and the tracking is going to be good. I guess I can turn that noise down so that it's not bugging some people. I know that the sensitive people out there are already on their keyboards screaming about the noise. There's our Beta 3 tracking. Again, looking pretty darn good. That's about as good as you're going to get. The next one on here should be uh, monoscope in beta 3 so we'll go to the 24 minute mark and this should be monoscope and this one is just a monoscope 5 kilohertz at minus 25 db and there's no like the switching is not in the middle of the field like it was on the beta 2 because we don't use this one for a dihedral we just use this one for uh, observing beta 3. If I switch be uh, super beta on and off, you'll see, notice the difference, beta, super beta is on and super beta is off. Hard to tell on a plasma screen, I know, but it is uh, slightly different. If it was a super beta tape and you ran it on a non-super beta machine, you'd notice it more than a non-super beta tape running on a beta, a super beta machine. 
anyway, this one now looks to be look perfect. I mean, that's as good as it's going to play back, which is, as you can see, perfect. So now I can rewind my tape. Put my special Sony alignment tape. Guard this with my life. I actually bought this one uh, when I worked at the shop. You're supposed to mark it down every time you use it, right? There's a little tally chart on here. When you when you use it that many times, you're supposed to throw it away and buy a new one. But these tapes were not cheap. These were like 150 bucks a pop to buy these tapes. And this doesn't have a lot of use on it. I don't. It's not like I run this tape every day. I had another one that didn't have the. It did not have the uh, Beta Hi-Fi. It was just straight uh, Beta. Rewind it back to the beginning. I think it's probably L125 that this was recorded on, so it was the heaviest tape that they made. Thicker tape than the regular tapes. But uh, that was it there. It's got a serial number on it. Don't store in your magnetic fields. You think I see that on here? Good. Best. Because I had I had two or three alignment tapes, and this was the one that was in the best shape because the other ones got kind of you know, worn and chewed up and stuff. This basically only went in my machines when I got this tape. And uh, I bought it at the shop. And then, as I say, it uh, it followed me home one day. I'm not saying I paid for it. I'm saying I bought it. But I'm not saying that I paid for it. My old boss paid for it. It followed me home when I left. I don't think he cared because he wasn't going to be fixing stuff anyway when I... When I left employment in 2003 from that establishment, um, the owner of the shop, just putting my scope probes away as I talk here, but the owner of the shop, he basically wanted to close the service department anyway. That was his big goal, was he wanted to shut down the service department and just concentrate on sales. And um, I don't think he was too worried about any extra tools that may have left the shop when I left.
This is a copy of an original tape that Sony put out for showrooms called A Great American Scene. It's uh, actually probably one of the better desert videos I've seen. It's just a portion of it. I've got the original tape. When Sony put these tapes out for showrooms, they had really wide stereo because they wanted to show off that beta hi-fi. The salesman would come up and say, well, here's mono. And here's stereo, of course. I picked the wrong time. Mono. Stereo. That was the big sales feature, right? You'd flip back and forth and say, well, here's what your VHS machine sounds like, because Beta had, Beta had Hi-Fi stereo a, a year or so before it, it was on VHS. So it was a big selling feature for Beta, and that was one of the reasons that Beta did so well in Canada in the early years was because they had stereo. Nobody else did. Well, I shouldn't say that. VHS had their linear stereo with Dolby noise reduction, which was like two tracks of AM radio, especially at the EP speed. So that was a, a big selling feature for the Betamax in the early days, was the stereo sound. And Sony put out some demo tapes, which really enhanced the, the sound. I know I can play this because I, I this video is up on my channel. I put this video up a few years back and I can play it and not get any copyright on it, so. Some creases in the tape, it's an old tape. What do you expect? Anyway, I'm just playing this to make sure that everything is good, but everything appears to be fine. My sound is back. And I fixed everything else on here. And this one had a few faults. It wouldn't fast forward and rewind properly due to that blown solenoid brake release. And um, it had the missing negative supply to the op amps in the sound. And that's why there was no audio. That's all resolved now. So I can put this one back together button it up and get it boxed up heading back to Toronto. Anyway, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. I'll let the video play out here. It's at the end here. As I prep this unit to put it back together. Nope. My tape is chomped up. Of course, this is a copy, so it's no big deal. I think this is actually EP or the yeah, I'm beta three too. Anyway, 
they had some uh, pretty good shots on this this video. We used to leave this one play in the showroom over and over and over, and then Sony's little logo comes up at the end because Sony did it. Still a few creases in here. There we go. That's playing back the recording. I mean, this was like made on my SL twenty seven hundred. So, okay, all done. Catch you in the next one. Bye.